I am absolutely honoured to have this next guest on the show. I am talking about the amazing Annette Densham. Now, she wears many hats. She recently took out the Silver Award at the Oz Mumpreneur Awards for Best Author of the Year. She's also a comedian, an accomplished author, of course, and a PR specialist. Some might call her the PR superwoman. <laughs> uh, if you've ever heard of Annette, you'll know what I'm talking about. She's an absolute gem. She's gone from being in the corporate world to then running her own business and has a really interesting story to tell. She shares a lot of the insights of her recent book release, How to Eat a Shit Sandwich and Keep Smiling. With a sense of humour and a bit of tricky and challenging times that have gone by, we really get to know Annette in this interview and what makes her successful and how she supports small business and female entrepreneurs and creatives on how to get into PR and really show us the way in the PR world. You are absolutely in for a treat. You're going to love having a bite of this better than shit sandwich. <laughs> so let's welcome to the show, Annette Denshin. Hey there, I'm Josephine Lancuba and you're listening to Business Arts and All That Jazz. I've been immersed in the creative business world and performing arts industry for over 20 years. I know from experience that being an artist, a creative or running a creative business can be a tough gig, but I'm here to tell you it's possible. I went from having zero dollars to my name and living below the poverty line to then living paycheck to paycheck, to finally living a life of comfort, happiness, passion, and even stability. In this podcast, I peel back the curtain and share with you the ups and downs of my journey. Plus, I tap into the minds of creative industry experts to discover their paths to success. I know you have a spark inside of you, that little voice that tells you to reach for the stars. I wanna help you step into your limelight to have the courage to live a life you dream of, a life that you design. So get ready to be entertained and inspired as we talk business, arts, and all that jazz. Welcome, Annette. I am so excited to have you here today. How are you doing? Josephine, I'm doing so well. I'm just busy, 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 and really enjoying what's landing on my plate. Yeah, look, I met you actually probably just, was it over a year ago? I was on your your show, Obsessed, and that was actually the first time I sort of stepped out of my comfort zone and jumped onto someone's, you know, podcast style show. Um, so thank you. That was my podcast, Virginity Broken. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was really cool that, um, you know, I got to experience that. And then, of course, having you here today. Um, now, the way I see it, you have many titles, um, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're a comedian, you're an author, you're a PR specialist. Um, you know, which role are you most connected to and or do they all dance together? Oh, oh that's a Oh, that's a really good question. I, I think that they all dance together because, like, I couldn't do comedy without it being fed by what I've experienced in my professional or my personal life. Um, you know, I, I couldn't be the writer that I am without having the PR and, and comms experience that I've had. And I definitely wouldn't be a writer if I wasn't interested and intrigued by other human beings. So, yeah, I, I think I was always destined to work with words and use them to excite, engage and make people laugh. Yeah, I mean, it's such a balancing act, isn't it? Because obviously when you're running your own business, um, you sort of have to have that personal branding as well as running the motions of whatever your offering is? Or what's your take on, you know, the balancing act? Oh, my God, I feel like an octopus sometimes. <laughs> Just the other six arms are invisible. but Or one of those ducks, you know, how they see ducks and they're just going, look at me, and underneath their legs are going. <laughs> but on the top you're like, 
Oh, really cool. So I, I think it really became apparent to me after leaving corporate and starting my own business like way back in like 2013 mm. that if people were going to know about what I could do is that I had to get comfortable or at least comfortable in my discomfort with telling my story. And, and up until that point, my whole career had been about telling other people's stories, like, you know, writing articles for newspapers and speeches and, you know, CEO reports for AGMs and then getting the pat on the back for it, me sitting there going, that was my work. <laughs> I made you look good. Yeah. And then realising I had to make myself look good and that was like, oh, my God, who, who do we not want to talk about when we're promoting is we don't want to talk about ourselves. Yeah. So I learned very quickly that there was no room in business for modesty and that I had to kind of suck up that discomfort and put myself out there. And, and I guess now, you know, almost 10 years later, I, like I don't even think about it. It's like, oh, God damn it, I want an award. I'm going to tell yeah. people about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, you mentioned you had a career in the corporate world. So, you know, how did your professional journey start? Well, I started, it started when I was 10, although I wasn't being paid for it. Um, you know, I was very much a bookworm and I spent a lot of time hiding in the library trying to get away from this boy who relentlessly bullied me mm -hmm. when I was in grade five and six. And uh, my, my life goal then was to see if I could fill as many reading list cards as I could because you got these cards and you had to read a book in each genre and I would just fill up pages and pages of this. And I started to think, yeah, this around the time people start saying to you, what are you going to do when you grow up? Yeah. And because I spent so much time in the library, I was looking at career books and I thought, well, you know, like I'm, I'm really good at writing. I like telling stories. I like reading. What could I do? And, you know, I went through the list of those skills and I had like librarian and teacher and lawyer um, and journalist. And I went, one of my favourite shows was 60 Minutes with Ray Martin and Yana Vent. <laughs> like seriously, I would, I just loved it. I loved the storytelling. I loved how they held their hands and I loved yeah. how they gesticulated. And I went, I'm going to be a journalist. Like what a great way to be a nosy Parker because that was one of my nicknames, nosy Parker, because I was constantly asking questions and use those skills. So by the time I was 15, I'd done work experience at a local newspaper and at one of the major TV stations. And I went, yeah, this is it. So as, as soon as I could, I got a job in newspapers and started my journey into journalism um, until I was in my mid-20s and I went, these people suck. Not all of them. Yeah. But very misogynistic, male-dominated industry still in the 90s. And I just went, I'm, there's my dog agrees. Um, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. So yeah. I left for four years and I, I went and worked with people with disabilities for four years as a support officer until I went, oh, my God, I miss writing. I don't want to write reports anymore. I want to write. So I scored a job with um, a fairly large um, publication and I worked for them for a number of years. <laughs> that dog. Um, what sort of dog do you have there? I just muted him and gave him an evil glare. Um, <laughs> it's like he's been quiet all morning. He is a Maltese poodle, so he's a little dog with a big voice who thinks that he's a Doberman. Oh, beautiful. Look, you, you know, you mentioned that there was a bit of a progression there from being, um, I suppose, that, that young girl who was, you know, interested in writing and journalism. I find that really interesting, actually, because I was interested in the same things and... Um, I wanted to be a lawyer, a lawyer and a journalist, but ended up in the performing arts. Funny, haha. -ha. And um, I actually did, um, what do you call it? Like a job placement in high school as well for a local newspaper. So there you go. Um, so a few similarities there. But um, how did you then go from being in that corporate space? You said you're unhappy to then, and obviously that misogynistic sort of um, environment that you were in to then running your own business? Like what made you really take that leap? I was pushed. 
Mm. I was like given the big old gung ho, like, thanks for coming. We don't want you anymore. So I'd been back, you know, I had in between all of this, you know, I had kid, had two kids. And uh, by the time my youngest had started primary school, I thought, you know, like I was doing a lot of freelance journalism work. Um, I wrote about forklifts for a year. And people always say to me, I work in this industry. Are you a specialist? And it's like, mate, if I can write about forklifts and ship to shore gantry cranes from the European market, I can write about anything. (laughs) Um, But, yes, I went back into corporate as a comms manager um, and it was the job in 2013. They'd headhunted me Mm. and made this beautiful Greenfields role and like, come in and make it your own and do this and we need your help and, oh, you're amazing to 12 months later is, you know, bugger off, we don't want you anymore, um, here's a redundancy payment. And so I will admit that I went into a very big black dark hole for probably six months because my spirit was crushed, Yeah, crushed. I was just... I watched Dexter. That will show you where my state of mind was at. You know, I love like, Dexter. I'm yeah, it was a great Dexter show. Fan. <laughs> and I, you know, I kept imagining. I was like, I wonder if I could get away with being a serial killer. <laughs> uh, I don't really like cleaning up blood. That could be a problem. But um, a friend of mine invited me to a seminar on how to use webinars to grow your business. So, because at this time I was really just looking for any job, a job, just give me a job at Target and I would have taken it. And so I went along to this webinar and I asked people to put their hand up who's a, an expert in something and my girlfriend ugh, gave me a big dig in the ribs. I'm sure I've still got the bruise. <laughs> put my hand up and went, well, I guess, you know, I've been a journalist and work, worked in corporate comms. I know how to connect people with the media. And it was like one of the organisers, his head, he was sitting at the back, I still remember it, typing away and his head went, I love it. And I got selected to do this, you know, webinar on, you know, the five secrets to getting a million dollars in PR. Wow. And uh, my business was born that weekend. So I walked away having done this hour webinar, which I really needed adult nappies on because I was packing it because I'd been hiding for six months and created this program. I think I called it the um, PR Mastery Program. And signed up five people, six, ten people, mm. and made five thousand dollars that weekend. And that was it. And, and that was it. Off I yeah. went. Like I yeah. had, I, I grew up in a blue collar family. Had no idea about entrepreneurship or running a business. In fact, I think I'm probably one of the worst business people on the planet because all of that admin-y, financey stuff is like, oh, I have to. But I've got to help people tell their stories and that's what made me really excited. Do you think being in PR is a creative role? Uh, Well, it it is. It's creative in terms of coming up with ideas and angles and places that you can pitch. But it's, it's also I've learned to be very creative in managing other people's expectations because mm. a lot of people think PR is a magic bullet and you write one media release, you flick it out and, you know, news.com picks you up and your website overloads because, you know, you, you're inundated with orders. But, it you know, it's like everything in business. It's strategic and there's creativity in being strategic and yeah. looking at if we do this now, the outcome in 12 months' time is going to be this. You know, and, and being able to manage people's patience of doing and implementing that strategy to get Absolutely. to the end goal. Mm. So, yeah, it is very creative because I'm very hands-on. I'm writing stories. I'm writing articles. You know, I, I, I write books for people. Like, I, if it's words then I'm creating something out of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being a PR superwoman, um, I have to say, <laughs> that's it, I love it. I love the super the superhero pose there. Um, I have to say, look, you do you did mention that there's an expectation that needs to be managed, and and I find that to be true in this space. Um, and I have to say, there can be a lot of confusion around PR, a lot of smoke and mirrors when it comes to PR. Um, I think it would be really helpful to our listeners to uncover exactly 
what is PR and how does it really benefit you? So how would it benefit an artist or a creative business? What is it that you guys do? Okay, so the, the traditional definition of public relations is, you know, pushing out content to media. You know, back in the day it was, you know, lots of phone calls and actually talking to journalists. It's like, oh, my God, who does that now? Um, sending media releases and, you know, pitching angles. Yeah. But in this day and age, I sound so old, listen to me, children, <laughs> this day and age is PR really is everything you say and everything you do and everything that people say about you. So mm. a modern PR strategy has to encapsulate multiple channels because let's face it, if we're going looking for someone, where's one of the first places we look? Google. Yeah. So you have to be Google-icious. Mm. You know, you've got to have articles out there. You've got to be on podcasts. You've got to enter awards. You know, you've got to have content on your website. You've got to do videos. You've got to be able to develop and push out yourself so that you build trust and likability with your prospective target audience. I love that Googleicious. Googleicious. I'm still hooked yeah. on that. That was yeah. that's very cool. And I've I got call, to become Googleicious. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to see if Beyonce wants to do a duet with me, and we can do. <laughs> your content is Googleicious. Oh, that uh, is so good. Because a lot of the time, people just go. Like I said before, I'll just send out a media release, and it'll get picked up. You know, chances are it won't. Because, mm. you know, any if you do anything in life one off, it's like losing weight, you know, oh, I'm going to eat really well one day. You know, it's like, no, you've got to do it every day. So PR is that strategic, persistent, consistent action every day of putting your message out there so that people connect with you. Because, and this is something that I've learned over the years that I, I, I better understand now, is that in our brain is called the limbic system. This is where our emotions are created. You know, when we look at, you know, uh, the bowl of, you know, prawns that I've got sitting in front of me and my brain starts going, oh, my God, I love prawns. They're so nice. I remember the time I ate prawns and I did this and that glass of champagne and I've, I've got this visceral emotional reaction to it. That's what you want your prospective clients to have and they can't have that if they're not seeing you everywhere. So PR is really perception, mm. is what perception are you creating out there through your content? And what's the relationship that you're building with your target audience that they get to connect with you and they trust you and they want to hand over their hard-earned money to you? Um, and then that relationship is also the relationship that you build with, you know, people like you who invite, you know, amazing people to come and to amazing people talking about myself, uh, on, onto your podcast. You are amazing, don't uh, Or <laughs> Facebook groups yeah. where there's yeah. so many opportunities to be able to help and serve other people without the expectation of return, that that shines the light on your thought leadership or on your skills and your abilities or your product and also the media and using them because they still have a really valuable role to play in the mm. PR process, either from earned media, which is you send your media release out, someone does a story, or paid media, where maybe you subscribe to th something like Brains Magazine, where you're an executive contributor for 12 months and mm. you're able to leverage off their authority and push your thought leadership out there as well. It was a very long answer. No, oh. I love that. I love that. And obviously, based on that, you can see that PR really is, especially in this day and age, an essential part of building um, a business, a personal brand around anything you do. Absolutely. And it, like, it kind of irks me when I see, you know, these online webinars and where they don't even mention PR. You know, they talk about you know, writing blogs or fixing up your LinkedIn or, mm. you know, just these little pieces. But, you know, PR really is that overarching umbrella of how do you take all of those things and push them out so that you are Googleicious and that when someone searches an indenture, like it's undeniable 
that when you do that, here's all of these like snippets that showcase that I didn't just make up what I'm talking about in the bath last night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and moving on from that, um, you yourself um, don't just, um, you know, do PR for others. You're obviously actively um, present for yourself. Um, and you, I mean, you can see that when you, you released your recent memoir, How to Eat a Shit Sandwich and Keep Smiling. Uh, love the title there. Um, now, that's, that's an interesting title, actually. Um, how did you come about with that one? Uh, oh, look, I've got an amazing partner in Shine, Lauren Clement, who is a branding expert, and I mm. don't use that word lightly. She's a genius in her space. And I, I had another one. My working title was Are We There Yet? Because mm. my book is really about like parenting fails, like my parents' failure in terms of providing my sister and I with safe environments and that we were always moving, you know, like as a kid, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, no sooner would you get settled than you packed up and you're moved along again. And Lauren said to me, we were going to an event and we were talking about the book and she said, you know, really, you've eaten a lot of shit sandwiches in your life. And I went and we looked at each other and went, oh, my God, that's a great book. And I said, but it's got to have the keep smiling in there because, you know, my favourite saying is it is what it is. And that's not a, like, resigned, oh, it is what it is. It's, it's an acceptance that what's happened to me is quite often out of my control, but I take responsibility for where I find myself and how do I move out of it so that my next experience is better. And that's where the mm. keep smiling comes in because without my sense of humour and the way that I look at, you know, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, is that I look at the world, you know, and see sparkles. I know there's grey out there and every now and again I have a bit of a ranty pants and, you know, because I've got, <laughs> really yes, got really strong values around, you know, um, you know, the position of women in society and social justice and, you know, like that. But mostly speaking, I see the good in people and mm -hmm. I, I see the humour in things. Sometimes it's a bit dark and disturbing, <laughs> hence my obsession with Dexter. But how to eat a shit sandwich and keep smiling really is a metaphor. Okay, we've all had shit happen to us in our life. Mm -hmm. Bad things have happened. I'm not on my own here. You know, my book's not like, oh, woe is an ant. You know, look at all these bad things that happened to her. Is, But they keep smiling at his, but look at where she ended up. Yeah. You know, she's she's happy, you know, content. I am I like who I am. I've got a great family. I've got awesome friends. I've got a thriving business. And life's good. It Life is yeah. what you make of it. And I've, I've never wanted to be a victim and that's what I hope my book yeah. stands for is Absolutely. that you can be a champion superhero. Woohoo, the superhero pose again. Look, you know, it has been described as shocking. Um, it does delve into some serious challenges of your past. I know um, myself, I'm, you know, come from a background of domestic violence and you touch on that as well. There was some violence in your ex-partnership. Um, so you really do bear all in this book. Oh, um, my, very courageous. Um, my sister read it. There's a chapter in there, and I know that, Josephine, you've, you've ordered a copy of the book. There's a chapter in there which is a bit risque, um, probably slightly pornographic. And my sister said to me, she said, I, my, her son said, oh, mum, should I get Auntie Nettie's book? And Lauren went, oh, well, mm. if you do, you may never look at your aunt the same way again. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of like... But, yeah, I, I wrote it in the style of the person I was at the time. So when you read the first chapter, it's from my earliest memory. I was three years old when my father left. And I've written it in the voice of a three-year-old, you know, the language. And it's written as a fictional book, but it's a memoir because I didn't want it just to be and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. So it's very dialogue heavy. You know, there's you, you can follow the relationships along and get immersed in that moment because it's written in the present tense. So if you're reading about, um, you know, so trigger warning about the, the, the relation, domestic violence relationship that I was in, it's in the moment. 
yeah. like you're living it with me. So I think that's where the shock value comes from because yeah. I was, I, I laid my heart bare. I poured every ounce of my being into that book and it was it was so cathartic for me because I realised there was a lot of things that I was holding on to. So I was, you know, better out than in. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I've, the feedback's been amazing because you, you have writer's remorse because, like, I think I'm a good writer, you know, People pay me to write, but mm. I'd never written a book like this before. So it was like, will my skills translate into this genre? Yeah. And I just I keep getting reviews and I'm like, oh, I think I'm going to cry. It's like. <laughs> I mean, I've read wow. excerpts of the book. Obviously, my, my copy's on the way and it was very powerful to read. Um, you know, obviously you talk about it being therapeutic in a way, but what was that real intention behind writing and sharing that part of your story? What, what was it that really made you do that? I think it was for the, the self-healing first and foremost, because, you know, like I started writing it during, you know, the, the first lockdown we had last year, um, you know, business had dried up, you know, what's the first thing to go when crisis hits, it's marketing and PR. So, okay. you know, all of those amazing clients that we started the year with just went we can't continue we don't have a business anymore so I was like what can I do with myself and um, I'm really good friends with Catherine Mora who's a book coach and a publisher and I'd said to her what do you reckon like I, I really want to write a book but I'm not sure what to write about and she said well write about something that you know and that's your life and because she mm -hmm. had snippets of, of my life and she went it sounds like it's it's really interesting. And so I went, okay. And then I thought, well, I work with a lot of women in business and I hear lots of reasons why they can't do what they need to do in their business. And it'll often be because of self-belief, um, their self-esteem has been ruined by past relationships or experiences in their past. And I thought, what if I could inspire people to read it see themselves in it and realise that the opportunities for them are still available, that just because they've been damaged and hurt doesn't mean that's the end. It doesn't mean that they can't recover because I think that I'm a pretty well-balanced, mentally healthy human being. And, like, when you read my book, like, I got to the end of it. I even went, how the fuck did I live through that? Like, how, how am I looking at the world and going, Oh, look at that sparkly rainbow. That's amazing. You know, or, or getting excited about, you know, like new things um, yeah. because there's, there's healing and sharing our story. And I want to encourage other people to share their story, even if they just write it for themselves or for their family, is that act of getting it out of your head. Because the thing is, is that, you know, our brain works on what's happening in our head is fact. It doesn't know whether it's real or not. It just treats everything in our head as fact. But once you get it out and you're able to reflect and intellectually look at what's happened to you, um, you know, there are some things that I thought I remembered mm. that didn't actually happen, that I'd extrapolated on that memory and filled in the gaps. Yes. And you know, and when my sister read it, she was like, oh, I don't remember that happening. Actually, that happened differently. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that was. That's, that's the mind of someone who's been through trauma. I actually can resonate with that sometimes I, when I think back of things or memories from childhood. It, yeah, it becomes a bit jagged or sometimes I'm unsure what's real and what's not at times. So Yeah. And, and, and to be up of my life. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. to be able to acknowledge and go, oh, that's not real. And, oh, my God, I've been hanging on to that belief through my adult life and it stopped me doing stuff mm. is incredibly powerful. And that happened to me. It was like I've been hanging on to this shit and I didn't have to. Totally. Like how crazy. It's like not wanting to go to the dentist because you're scared of needles and then you have the needle and it was like, oh, that actually didn't hurt at all. I, that up in my head. <laughs> I mean, sharing one story is obviously a very powerful way to connect with your audience. Um, now, I think a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs think about writing a book. 
a lot of people in business think about writing a book. What would you say to anyone considering this? Oh, do it. Absolutely do it. Don't let that voice in your head that says that you can't write or you've got nothing to say stop you because that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You have got so much value to give to the world that you should get it out there to share it, to inspire others, to encourage others, even first and foremost, selfishly to inspire and encourage yourself because, Mm -hmm. as I just said, what's it what you've got to get things out of your head it's like people who've got a business and you go do you have a marketing plan or a business plan or a strategy and they go it's all in my head and it's like what good is it there yeah like what what happens if you know you get sick you need someone else to take over or you're bringing on a new staff member or you're entering an award and it's all in your head you're just making things so much harder so if you're thinking about writing a book share your story. Like I'll be cheering you on. I'll be right <laughs> behind you. I'll be in front of you going, yeah, I want to hear that. I well, hear I'm, I'm, I'm sort of breaking into that myself actually through the Ausmumpreneur Network. So I've um, been selected to join a collective of women for the Women Changing the World um, book project. Me too. Yay. So that's, I have not seen you on any of the calls. You're too busy, Missy. So yeah. Okay. So you're in there too. I think so. Is this the new one? Yes, this is the new one. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think we'd had a call yet. Oh, I, look, in tut, my defense, I'm going to have to give you a, yeah. a little tut tut on the wrist there. No, Peace and fantastic. Katie, I'll smack my bottom. But in my defense, I have been writing a lot of awards. So Yeah, no, no, no. That's awesome. Okay, amazing. Okay, great. So we'll be sharing the, the pages of that one. Yeah, so that that's sort of my debut into publishing. Um, obviously not yours. Um, you've got many many credits there um any other books in the pipeline or I oh my gosh I can't stop now it's like I really need somebody (laughs) to fund me just so I can write books because trying to run a busy business and write a book is hard I I think the next one is going to be about my weight loss journey yeah um but I I think I'm going to write it from a fictional point of view like an actual fictional story based on me and it's good. Have you ever read any of Marion Keys? No. Oh, she's a very funny Irish writer and, and one of my inspirations for writing. Um, I love her style. I love the way that she puts wit and humour through some very serious topics. So I'm going to emulate her style and write oh, a, nice. hopefully a very funny book about <laughs> the weight loss journey and, you know, the things that go through your head and, you know, how you feel about yourself. And then my next book is going to be another fictional one. It's going to be like a science fiction mystery book about um, a group of people who live in the same house but never actually interact because everyone's in their own bedrooms and this big disastrous thing that happens that brings them together. It was inspired by my own family of two teenage and 20 year old children who it's kind of I said to my son the other day oh I've noticed you're getting along with your brother much better and he went oh when I see him I only see him for like a minute in the morning and a minute at night and I went well it's nice to see those minutes are counting yeah absolutely and I can see in the background that you've got a quite an array of awards um and also congratulations on congratulations on your recent award with Osman Preneur author of the year but that's not your first. You've got so many. I would dare say that you are the queen of awards. Um, not only do you win awards yourself, but you help others to win awards. Um, why are you so focused on entering awards? I, I guess it's, you know, like if I'm going to be really deep about this and it just jumped into my head, I think it was because I was such a loser at school. <laughs> I didn't oh, no. I, like seriously I didn't win anything I was always the new kid I was taller I was you know bigger like I look back I used to get picked on and bullied and called fatty and piggy and I look back and think I wasn't fat I was just I tall and it's broad awful. but the only award I had ever won in my life was the top dog award for achievement when I was in grade two so it's like 1978 never won anything never won a running race um you know I did really well at school but I never really stood out because I was always hiding so nobody would notice me 
So when I started in my business and I went, oh, I've got to promote myself, I thought a bit back to my corporate career and went, you know, all of those men that I wrote awards for, they weren't shy about <laughs> um, acknowledging their wins. So why should I? So my first award was the Ausmumpreneur Award. I think it was like 2015. And I didn't even make the finals, but it triggered something in me because that process of answering the questions and reflecting mm. was so powerful. So my first award, it's like up over there, was a bronze in the Stevie Women in Business Awards PR Startup of the Year. And I was just blown away. It was like, oh, my God, I'm doing something right. So I guess I focus on it because particularly for women in business, because we really aren't very good at tooting our own horns. Yeah. And the process that we go through is not just from a business point of view, a great strategy to get clients and to build your credibility. It's the serendipitous things that happen that sometimes you can't quantify, they're intangible. It's the, you know, getting your draft back and looking at it and going, oh my God, are you sure that's me? Because she sounds too amazing to be me. Mm. It's winning the award and having that confidence boost. It's, you know, feeling like you're being recognised for, because I think deep down secretly we all want to be acknowledged for our skills and our abilities, but we grow up in a culture where we're not encouraged to do that, you know, tall poppy syndrome and don't be a show off and, Especially yeah. in Australia, there's definitely a case of tall poppy syndrome. And I think I think slowly and, um, you know, consistently there are changes in that sort of perspective. I can see that in a lot of the women's business groups and things and networks that I'm a part of, that there is a shift where we're trying to remove that tall poppy syndrome and start supporting each other more. And I'm championing that because I have met so many, like I've, one day I'll sit down and count how many awards I've written, but, you know, it'd be hundreds. Wow. And I think about, I'd say 90% of them are, are women in business mm. and getting to the end of them and going, oh, my God, you are amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the person going, oh, no, I'm not really. And it's like I'm going to come over there and give you a big boot up the backside because, you are, you have just created something incredible. Like I, just before I spoke to you, I was speaking to a lawyer and the, and she was going, oh, but my team did this and my team did that. And I went, but without your leadership, without your focus on culture, without your values, you would not have this. Absolutely. And she was like, well, I guess so. And it's like, well, no, there's no guessing. I embrace know, so. it, lady. Yeah, embrace <laughs> it. And, and I want to see the time where I can say, you know, hey, Joe, man, that's a beautiful jumper. And you go, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I love it. It's, and it is. I want to come over and stroke it. It looks really yeah, it's nice. A little soft. Yeah, it's nice and fluffy. Um, okay, so do you think that winning an award translates into actual money in the bank do people do you get clients from winning awards oh look some in some cases directly absolutely and it's Mm. really obvious you know I've got a I'm working with a client who's an accountant at the moment and you know she'll message me and go oh I just scored this client because they saw that I won women in finance awards last year but quite often the new clients come from that googaliciousness that I talked about is that awards are really just one element of an overarching profile building strategy mm. that you can't just rely on awards to win your business, but you also have to get really good at leverage. So I can't tell, I'd say 80% of the women that I've written awards for have been not the best that leveraging their wins. So they win the award and then you never hear anything about it. So winning the award isn't the be all and end all. It's what you do with it afterwards. Oh my gosh, yeah. If no one knows, so like, you know, you go onto my Facebook page and have a look at the post that I put up about winning silver in the Osmondpreneur Awards author of the year. I like, 
uh, I've had over 450 likes, which like to the kid who was bullying and hid in the library, deep down my, my self-esteem is going, oh, my God, people like me. And hundreds of comments mm. of people who are saying that's inspiring, you know, good on you, Annette. And, you know, out of that, there'll be people who go, oh, I'm looking for someone to write an award. And I'll go, oh, I saw this post from Annette. Yeah. You know, or right. hang on, I remember Annette posts a lot about awards and she's won some. So she'd be the right person to go and work with because you just never know what's going through people's heads. So yeah. you don't I'm, leave I'm all anything. about that. I'm all yep. about that. Um, I mean, I never used to be, but I did enter the um, Osmopreneur Awards in 2020 and I won the gold for creative arts, which is the first place. And I was like, yay. That was my first award as an adult. And it was a pretty amazing feeling. I, I do understand what you were saying in, re, in, in relation to that um, acknowledgement, especially during that COVID period. So, um, yeah, I, I share it. Absolutely. It's in my sign off on the email that I'm an award winning, you know, creative entrepreneur. I, I even have what I call a rock star intro for our production. So when our kids go on stage to, to do our musical theatre shows, I get one of our staff to say, directed by award-winning Josephine Lancuba. And like the staff all have a bit of a gag about me being the award winner. I'm like, hey, dudes, I didn't win this shit for nothing, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, I put in the hard work. Yeah, let's let's um, tell people, you know. Yeah, tell people. So I'm, I'm all about that. Um, so tell me, you mentioned likes, and that was actually my next question. What's your take on social media in a world obsessed with clicks and likes? How important are likes? Well, look, that's one post I mentioned. That was really nice, but it, it's I'm not going to lose sleep. You know, the next day I posted about watching, you know, the SBS documentary Strong Female Lead and, and the treatment of Julia Gillard by Australian politicians and the public, mm -hmm. and I think I got three likes. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, <laughs> Like, let's go and it winning an award over something really important about, you know, gender equality and nobody pays. But here's what I know after years of being a journalist and, and working in this space is that there are far more people watching than there are clicking and liking and mm -hmm. commenting. Mm -hmm. And those, I, I can't tell you the number of people who contact me and say, hey, I've been following you for years, you know, or people are going, oh, my God, I've been stalking you. And I'm, like, going, I don't know who you are. Like, yeah. I've, like I've never interacted with That's you. That's the power of social media, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so don't get too fixated on your likes and the comments is the key is to be consistent, is, you know, show up in groups. Don't just post one post because there'll be people who will be, watching and reading who need what you've got to share that will help them and you know like I'm a big believer in the law of reciprocity yeah. is that it will come back to you in some shape or form I know that sounds a little bit woo woo but no, uh, it, it's, it's happened it's how I've built clients profiles it's how I've built mine is that the more that you give the more that you get back yeah so I'm a bit you'll see me in so many social media, Facebook group, particularly Facebook groups, where I'll share a huge list of awards. Now, I charge to do that for people. Um, but, you know, I figure there's a lot of people who can't afford to work with me. But I remember being a startup or being new in business and, mm. and being hungry for information. So I think as much as I can put out there as possible, the more it's going to help someone. And if you take that mindset with your business is that you will reap the rewards. And, yeah, yeah it's nice to be liked and, no, it's all well and good to be an influencer and get paid lots of money. I'm not. So maybe there's a little bit of, you know, sour grapes there. It's like pay me, people. Um, <laughs> but I, I truly believe that people do business with people who are genuine, who are real, who are authentic, who wear their heart on their sleeve, who are vulnerable enough to open up about, you know, not just the good that happens in business and life, but the pitfalls and the bad things, because that's the stuff that we relate to. And 
that is far more powerful than whether someone likes your political comment. Or- yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and this is a little off topic now, but um, I, you got me thinking as well because you're obviously really out there and putting yourself out there in every way possible. You're are you still doing stand up um, comedy? What's happening in that space? Uh, look, I haven't for a while because of COVID, and, and uh-huh. I live on the Gold Coast, and they, they don't do any open mics on the Gold Coast. Everything is um, paid, you know. So you've got to be a professional, right? Um, professional. Uh, and I've got to go to Brisbane to do it. I oh, look, I've got a busy business, and I, you know, I don't have time to travel an hour to do that. So I kind of put it on the shelf. But my next comedy gig is October 16 on the Gold Coast. Woo-hoo. Somehow I said yes to someone Great. who went, "Hey, I can't do this because of lockdown. Can you do it for me?" And I went, "Okay, <laughs> all right." I'll I'll do that. Like, oh fuck, what am I going to talk about? Yeah, so okay. yeah, that's October 16th. So I've got a month to practice my jokes and get up so I don't embarrass myself. You'll be fine. You'll but be I hilarious. Think I, I think I do comedy every day. I mean, the way that I look at life and yeah. you know the 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 witticisms and the smart ass comments that I drop. Like I, I would be really bad in a highly professional environment because I just, I can't help but sling shit on people yeah. in a very nurturing, loving type of way. Yeah, but- oh, I've seen your comedy on YouTube, so I'm thinking it's going to be great. So I know it's a bit hard with them, especially stand-up comedy or anything that's very, you know, um, on your own, on stage, you're the you're the person that is the sole focus of that piece um, as a performer. I get that. So you know, it's been a while, but you're going to be amazing. I'm I'll sure. be amazing. I just got yeah. butterflies thinking about it. Going okay, okay. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of questions before we finish. I always like to ask, who inspires you? Who inspires me? Look, I'm going to have to. I'm going to say that the person who inspires me the most would be my children. Yeah, they're growing up in a very different world to what you and I grew up in, the pressures on them are incredible. Mm. But despite all the challenges, my youngest son has autism. So his resilience and courage just like I'm in awe of every day. And my eldest son who, you know, is, 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 you know, like I said to him the other day, he said something and I went, you know what's finally hit me, mate? I said, I think you're on the spectrum too. You're very high functioning. But there's so many traits of your personality that just tick those boxes. Mm-hmm. And I understand now why you really struggle with social situations. And But he pulls on his boots every day and he goes out and he does his job and, you know, he's he's working on himself. So set, Quinn's 17 and Zade's 20. Oh, beautiful. And so you've I got think, older kids. Yeah. yeah, older kids, yeah. Mine, I, I can leave them with a bowl of dog biscuits and water and they'll be fine. <laughs> I think that, like, after watching Strong Female Lead on SBS the other night, mm-hmm. I have to say that I think Julia Gillard is also someone that I would aspire to be because she went through the ringer through that three-year period and, you know, 2010 to 2013, Oh, and use definitely. that as a platform to speak about gender inequality and misogyny and sexism. And it's like I, I would have wanted to have run and hid after what happened to her and I looked yeah. at her, I cried through it, and I was just like, man, you're one gutsy, dignified, incredible human being and, you know, like I'm really proud that you led our country even for a short while because yes. you showed what was possible. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what's next for Annette? Well, oh, like I'm going to finish this and I'm going to go keep working on awards. But um, we're going to continue to build the Audacious Agency mm-hmm. to a point where you know, systems and processes are schnick and you know, everything's running smoothly that we can put in somebody to manage it and we can start moving away from the day-to-day and focus on, you know, the the projects that, you know, really make my heart sing. I I really want to to write more books, but I'd really, really like to write books for other people as a ghostwriter 
to go wow. through that, you know, to go through their story mm-hmm. of their life and write it in a way that moves people. Like, well, I, I'm, I feel truly blessed that I have the skill to listen to somebody and then write a story that elicits an emotion mm. that inspires people, that makes people cry, that, you know, makes them angrier or, or, or causes them to act. Yeah. Um, that's a, a really cool skill to have. So if I can apply that and help people write books, I'd, I'd love to be doing that for the rest of Beautiful. my life. Makes your heart sing. Love that. Okay, so um, how can people find you if they want to learn more? We'll obviously put them in the show notes and whatnot, but you tell yeah. us. Where's the best well, I'm to very go. Googleicious. So you can Google an at Denture and I'll pop up everywhere. But um, I've got my Facebook page, although I am at 5,000 people, I'm going to have to do some culling. Um, the Audacious Agency, which is yeah. on Facebook, um, Audacious Agency, which is A U D A C I O U S um, on the internet. Um, and yeah, connect with me on Facebook. I'm always up for a bit of a chat and um, to say hello and to point someone in the right direction. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I've absolutely had a blast. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your time. It was beautiful to catch up with you again, Annette. Thank you, Josephine, and me, you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed listening and would like to hear more, be sure to click subscribe. If you're really feeling the love, share us with your friends. To work with me or to simply find out more about the magic of creativity, arts and business, head to my website, josephinelancuba.com and you can find me on socials. I also have a book that I've co-written with a bunch of amazing entrepreneurial women called The Women Changing the World. And you can grab a copy of that at josephinelancuba.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening.